once this new gene was found, what does that mean? What did it show? What does it do? Right, so it's with every new gene discovery, it tells us a little bit more about what it is that goes wrong in patients with ALS. And in this particular gene, NEC1, it's been shown to help the neuron have their shape and uh, it also is involved in the protein of, uh, sorry, the transport of protein within cells. Um, it actually has a lot of different functions and mutations make the uh, protein product go away, um, but we do not really know which function it is that's important that these people no longer have. So there's still a lot of research that needs to be done uh, now that we've identified this new gene. But how big is the fact that this gene was found? Is it a huge deal? Um, this is a gene that probably accounts for about 3% of patients with ALS. Now, it may not sound a lot, but that's still you know, a significant number of patients. Um, as you may know, the gene we found here at Mayo Clinic about five years ago is really the most common genetic cause of ALS, which explains about 30% of patients with familial ALS and also about 5% of patients with sporadic ALS. So obviously, um, when, when that gene was found and the therapies that are being developed to try and tackle that gene defect, it obviously affects a larger number of patients. But still, like every time we find a gene, no matter how few patients it directly affects, it really still tells us a lot about the disease in general. And very quickly, the gene that was found five years ago by Mayo Clinic here in Jacksonville, what percentage of people are affected by that and what has been able to come of finding that gene? Right, so um, the gene that was found five years ago is called a repeat expansion in the chromosome 9 gene c 9 orf 72 and it really explains a third of all the familial patients with ALS and about 5% of patients who do not have a family history of ALS, so-called sporadic patients. And it was really a very important finding, um, first of all, because there were so many individuals, or very patients that are affected by this specific mutation, um, but it also kind of opened a whole new field of how could a repeat expansion, which is a very unusual type of mutation, how could it cause ALS? Um, so what has happened in five years, actually quite a lot, um, including, I, um, um, so what has happened in five years, actually quite a lot, um, some of the money that was raised by the Ice Bucket Challenge has been used to generate cellular models, animal models, and we are even now at the point where people are talking about so-called antisense therapies, uh, where they're using small pieces of RNA to, um, to, to attack the harmful um, forms of the gene that are being generated in this disease, uh, and they're trying to eliminate it, and, and, and in doing so, try to uh, to find a therapy for these patients. And this is actually a therapy that's now been developed for several forms of ALS and, and something that we're hoping that could go into clinical trials in the next several years. And it sounds like we're right on the edge of finding something that can help fight it. Yes, um, although it's, it, I mean, it's still, as with all research, uh, it works in cellular models and animal models. It's still a long way until we have proof that this will actually be something that will help patients. But we're very hopeful and we've definitely made great progress in part through funding that came in through the Ice Bucket Challenge and also just because uh, technologies are changing very rapidly. We have very good new genomic technologies that help us identify these genes. Um, there's just all sorts of new advances that really help us to now uh, tackle these problems that we couldn't do several years ago. So it's a very exciting time in science. And I was going to say, when the Ice Bucket Challenge was at its height and you knew that the research was going to be funded by so much money, that surely that had to make you excited as well. Absolutely, yes. And, and it really has made a great impact, I think, on the ALS um, uh, research community as a whole. And, and one thing that uh, also the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge did, and this is through the um, ALS Association, the National uh, ALS Association, is they funded a lot of young researchers, so young postdoctoral fellows, young clinicians, and really trying to bring in these new young people into the field of ALS. Um, it's very important because you know, these are the people that are going to do the work in the future and um, to try and get them engaged into ALS research is very important. So this is something I think that also has strengthened our fields and, um, and is really good for the future. So for people who are listening to what you're saying and about all of the advancements that were made because of the money that came in from the Ice Bucket Challenge and they're thinking, huh, I wonder if I should still give what do you say? I would say yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a long way to get from the discoveries we make in the lab all the way to uh, clinical trials. And the other thing we have to think about is the development of biomarkers, for example. These are small 
uh, molecules that can help um, identify individuals who are at risk of developing the disease even before they have any symptoms or it will um, be able to allow us to say who will have a fast disease progression or slow disease progression. These are very important things that we're still working on. So I would say to these people, uh, yes, please continue to give. It's very important. Uh, continue to raise awareness of the disease uh, by talking to your colleagues and friends about it. And uh, yeah, it will still be very important to reach our goal.